Hello there, uh, welcome to Better Convo. It's uh, Sunday and it's so nice to be with you here today. Uh, my name is Wally and um, uh, I've got someone very, quite very interesting fella today. I uh, will be talking, obviously talking Better Convo, uh, obviously talking about athletics and um, well, what's going on generally in my guest's life today. So I've got Roberto Manje here uh, with me today, um, talking to Roberto all the way in Maine, I suppose. Uh, he's going to confirm that um, for me just in about a second when he comes on. Uh, Roberto is a um, Equatorian uh, uh, Guinean uh, Olympic middle and long distance runner, so also an Olympian, you know, an Olympian, all right? So uh, we're going to be talking about his experience at the Olympics, his experience now in what he's doing as a New York road runner. Um, he's a senior manager there. Uh, what what is a New York Roadrunner? Okay, so we're going to be talking about that today. So uh, without much ado, let me just welcome Roberto to the studio today. Roberto, thanks for joining us all the way in Maine. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, hello, everybody out there in the rest of the world, wherever you're watching from and listening from. Happy to be here. Yeah, uh, good. And I suppose there's someone very special that's going to be watching today on today's Mother's Day. And that's your yeah. mom all the way from uh, in Equatoria, Guinea, watching us. Hello, mom. Yeah, hola mama. <laughs> yeah, hola mama. <laughs> or, or in English, she, she speaks more languages than I do, I think. So, wow. Okay. You know what? I'm just going to start with you. Uh, with, talking about languages, I'm going to start from there. Uh, before, obviously, we talk about your experience uh, at the Olympics. You've been, you lived quite a lot of places in the world. You lived in, you were born in Spain, in Barcelona. Uh, you live in Germany, in Mali, Egypt. <laughs> Swaziland. Swaziland, all over the world. You're like a man of the world. Tell me, what was it like moving from one of one country to the other? Um, was that like, um, do you get settled in one place and then suddenly you move and then you have to readjust to the other place? What's been like, what has it been like for you? Um, it's been great. I think it's really uh, helped really shaped my my character and, and how easily I could adjust to different things that life throws at you. Obviously, right now, I'm in Maine, not a place I've ever lived in before, but my wife's from Maine. And, uh, you know, when 2020 kicked off and, and COVID-19 became a reality, we had to completely pivot both um, professionally and also, you know, with your life. So growing up around the world, it was the same thing. I would get comfortable in one country in one culture, start to feel immersed and start to learn the language um, in when I was in Mali, in Bamako, I started to learn Bambara, which is a beautiful wow. language. I still remember a few words. Uh, so shout out to all my uh, Malian friends. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> next thing you know, obviously being little, I had different perspective, but it seemed like overnight we would be getting on a plane headed to uh, Egypt or headed to uh, Southern Africa or, or headed you know, back to Europe. So um, it really gave me an appreciation for people because mm through sports, which is obviously what we're talking about here in Better Convo, but also just in general, you find that the best way to learn about people and cultures is by being in, immersed in their culture. And it really helped break down barriers. So it really mm -hmm. opened up my my worldview and it hasn't changed. And it's something that now as a as an adult and as a father, I, I really hope to to instill in my in my children. Oh, that's brilliant. And tell me, of all these places you've lived, where would you look back and say, wow, I really enjoyed my time at this place, this particular place? All right. I, I like that question because I thought you were going to go a slightly different way that was going to put me more <laughs> on the spot. It's like, where's your favorite? Because that's that's also tough. But um, <laughs> honestly, I I really liked it all. I, I would say maybe, if I had to pick one, maybe um, in Swaziland and, and South Africa, just because, um, you know, growing up, in a multicultural, multiracial mm -hmm. uh, place like Barcelona and, and also Equatorial Guinea, um, going down to uh, South Africa and Southern Africa and Swaziland it was the first time I got to see um, Caucasian people, people with blonde hair, blue eyes that identified very strongly as African and, and they had their, their culture there and, and their upbringing. And, and I really loved that, especially, you know, as South Africa is called like the, the rainbow flag and the rainbow nation. So, um, and also it was just a beautiful country and, Additionally, which kind of ties into today's interview, it's also, I would say, the birthplace of, of my running. Um, that's where I still started to to run. Part of that, um, I was just focusing more on, on any other sports, martial arts, uh, football, which we spoke about briefly. But um, I would say that's where my running started to, you know, materialize. 
Okay. And when you say running, um, it was it was more of a, uh, your better place of uh, running. Were you always inclined towards running middle and long distance, or were you just like, you know what, I'm just going to give it a try? Or were you pushed into it, so to say? Yeah, no, we had a we had a field day back then, and all the kids just ran the same distance, which I don't even know what it was. Maybe two laps around the um, the campus, and some of us had shoes, some of us didn't, and and yeah, I finished second in the whole school, and I was I, the only kid that beat me was younger, uh, sorry, older than me. So that's when I was like, oh, okay, maybe I have some talent. And then uh, my folks took me to a race, and and my mom was watching, so she could correct me. I can't remember where. I think it was in South Africa, maybe Durban, maybe Cape Town, Joburg. I, I don't even know. And um, I had these awesome high tech shoes that the brand was high tech, and I remember lining up, feeling really spiffy and then i looked around and most of the people around me were barefoot and i was like oh i felt self-conscious like maybe i should be barefoot um and i believe it was a 10k race and i finished second there in my age group so but i was i was just like a little kid i, I just ran fast and i think i was maybe more inclined for sprints but i didn't know the distance i just wanted to run as fast as i could no pacing <laughs> and at what time did you think you were going to be like um represented particular country i mean uh you could have represented spain you could have probably represented swaziland or south africa but you chose like equatorial guinea um i know your mom is from equatorial guinea but at what point did you um decide or were you were you impressed to, to choose equatorial guinea um, I mean, I would say, and just a correction for those listening, I only really had the option of uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, Swaziland or South Africa. I wasn't, uh, I was living there, but that'd be like saying I had the opportunity to represent Egypt because I also lived there when I was younger. But, mm. um, you know, I, I just find that, as I say, I'm, um, Barcelona born globally raised. So I have my feet firmly footed in two different cultures in, in Barcelona, which is very tied to a lot of my families there and Equatorial Guinea, which I always love going back there. So from an early age, um, the first time I ever got on a plane was to go from Barcelona to Malabo, Equatorial Guinea. And it was very important for my mom for, um, for my mom, for me to meet that side of my family and, and get to know um, that side. So it was always instilled in me even later on when I was in high school, which I, it was in the US. So um, I always knew that if I was going to do anything on the world stage, if I had an opportunity to represent Equatorial Guinea, it would be a great honor because even though it's a small country, as I was saying before, it has a lot of great people there, a lot of great athletes. It's just giving them the opportunity to, 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 and the platform to be elevated. So mm -hmm. for me, it was a great honor and it's something that I still want to do, even though now I'm obviously uh, retired. Mm. I'm talking about um, honors. You went as far as representing Equatorial Guinea at the biggest stage, the Olympics, and this was 2004. Yeah. What, what was, what was going through your mind at that time, getting into that stadium that day? flying Equatorian Guinea flag and you know people back home are watching probably rooting for you what, what was it like for you as a person representing a tiny African country filled with great people and yeah. you know what was it like for you it was it was fantastic honestly it was a great honor not something I, I took for granted grant um obviously I was only 21 22 in 2004 so I'm dating myself I'm 39 now <laughs> um but it, it was the sort of thing where you don't realize it till after the, the 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 enormity of it you know you know the Olympics you know it's literally billions of people watching but for me it was more like focusing on on my family focusing on on my 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 colleagues my teammates there and then also um friends that i had back all over the world you know i say back home but literally all over the world but it was just a great honor because i knew that and i've mentioned this many times if i'd represented the us or some of these other larger nations um unless you're like a lebron james michael jordan like <laughs> michael phelps whatever like you're kind of lost in the shuffle where for me having a smaller stage to um a smaller country to represent it i knew that i had a larger platform and i had more eyes on me and, and more weight of the nation supporting me and and that i again i, I took as a, a great honor and it wasn't lost on me mm. and obviously the highlight for me for that's for me personally uh, at the olympics uh, 2004 olympics when you were running was that trip and then you continued and obviously with a very sore ankle. What, what pushed you that time? Uh, I mean, again, I think the Olympics are a great, great 
event, global event, historic, but I think too often we get tied up into winning first, second, mm-hmm. third, and uh, and other than that, it doesn't matter, and and how fast you ran and, and things like that. And and the Olympics is about the whole world coming together, you know, putting down their arms, putting down their differences. And for me, it was really an honor again being there because I, I got to see, uh, again, this is at the beginning of the, of the 2000s, American friends of mine that were in the Olympic teams getting to know um, Iraqi um, Olympians as well. And this was a time where, you know, those two countries were not on such friendly ground. So I knew that the Olympics were much bigger than about competing. So when I was out there, I had a race plan. My coach and I trained. I was so fit that it was really, really disappointing that the trip happened, mm-hmm. that the accident happened. But I knew that I was there running for more than just myself. I was running for the Olympic spirit, running for Equatorial Guinea, running just to maybe inspire that kid, that young boy, young girl at home watching to not give up and and something that I could look back and tell my kids about. So um, a combination of adrenaline and, and, and rage kicked in and I was like, I have to finish. So I got up and I ran as fast as I could to try to catch up. But obviously as the adrenaline wore off, my ankle really started to hurt. And, and that was, and I knew my race was over. I knew I wasn't going to qualify, but I knew that I still had to hold my head up high because you're not out there by yourself. Um, you're up there representing an entire country and I want to give the best face possible. Mm. And obviously you had to withdraw from the 3000 meter um, stupid chase after that. Yeah. How disappointed were you to do that uh, to undergo <sighs> that? Mate, I was absolutely gutted. Uh, I mean, yeah. to this day, because the the steeplechase is actually one of my favorite, if not favorite event to both watch at the Olympics um, and also compete in. And I, I knew that I couldn't line up and do it justice. I, I could line up and just kind of check that box. But like, I was afraid I would make do more damage because of the nature of the event, jumping, mm-hmm. landing, you know, the water um, hazard as well. So I couldn't even limp my way through it. I, I'm had, had a hard, I had a hard enough time walking. So I was disappointed, but, you know, I spoke to my coach. I spoke to, um, you know, the, the Federation dele- uh, delegates and I said, listen, I, I want to represent Equatorial Guinea as best as possible and I don't want to do more damage. Um, and I think this would be doing a disservice to the country, to my colleagues uh, and to the event as well. You know, I, I think if you're in the event and things go sideways, that's one thing, but lining up, knowing that I was not going to, I was going to be out there for way longer than I should. Um, it's not something I wanted to do. So it was disappointing, but it was a great learning lesson. Mm. And what was the reception like back home at uh, Nicotero Guinea? Uh, um, obviously you must have had probably uh, messages from from back home especially from from your mom um your friends watching especially yeah. after that trip that time what was that what was the support like what was the message to you then yeah the the message was really supportive because um you know people just haven't been on, on that sort of world stage the, the people that you're trying to inspire they got it right away and and mm. they see you know some people knew me from when i was a little kid some people knew my family and they never met me and some people just knew my name from somebody who studied um and went to school in the us but th- all that we're all one nation and, and and there was so much unity so yeah there was a lot of disappointing and people saying you know i wish you could have done better but there's also a lot of support like hey you were out there you did really great and and we're really we're really happy that that you were able to represent us. So um, I think for me it was more like I internalized the the disappointment differently because I, I have my own standards and at the end of the day I wanted to do better and I knew I could do better and I was in much better shape. So it was it was great to have that support. And and years later, since I've gone back as recent as, as December of 2019, um, I still have people stop me in the street and and remember that. So it's it's a it's a nice feeling. We're just going to take a quick break just now, and when we come back, we will talk about the uh, the later part of your life and obviously what you're into now. So uh, stay there, and we'll be back soon. This is Better Combo.
Hello, welcome back. My name is Wally and you're still watching and listening to Better Convo. I've got with me Roberto Manje, uh, Equatorian Guinea uh, Olympian. Um, obviously, you probably might remember him from 2004 Olympics. So that's the man I'm talking about, okay? Um, Robert, Roberto, um, thank you uh, for joining us once again. Um, yeah, thanks for having I know me. We talked a bit yeah, I know we talked a bit about uh, the Olympics, and um, I told you obviously my highlights from the Olympics. Um, obviously, the trip and whatever you. Um, what would you say was the most memorable thing you look back to when you remember the Olympics? Um, aside from the trip, you know, uh, what would you? I know you said you're going to tell your 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 kids, your children about the fact that it takes bravery and whatever you. But aside that, what would you? look back to when you remember the olympics uh i would say uh the the wonderful people i met from all across the world um you know i've made such fr so many friends there and such long lasting friendship one of them being the whole reason why i'm on the show today uh yomi who funny enough we, we go back 17 years and we still have not ever met in person so um <laughs> yeah and then i have some other friends that i that i still continue to uh, keep in touch with but uh, yeah i would say the the friendship like i said the the olympic spirit and the idea of it is for the world to come together lay down their their arms you know in the olden days and put their differences aside and compete to see who's the highest strongest fastest etc and at the olympics it was an opportunity to feel like you're part of this excellent collegiate campus where everybody was a supreme varsity athlete and everybody was at the peak of their athletic prowess and for me it was really great to meet people and interact mm -hmm. with different cultures because it, it kind of took me back to my upbringing where i was getting to meet people in different countries except for here we're all in one olympic village so yeah th that that experience is what i really take away with and, and i look back on it and it was just so unique and something that it's it's really hard to to express and capture if you haven't been there uh yeah, I don't know. I've never been to Olympics before. I know I'm not not that's an athlete or probably so. Yeah. I'm actually looking forward to the next Olympics, so maybe I can capture that. But obviously, yeah. I've been a spectator watching the London Olympics here, which was really magnificent. So, um, tell us about what you're doing now, uh, Roberto. You are at the moment senior manager of runners training and education for New York Road Runners. Tell me first, what is New York Road Runners? What's that all about? Yeah, certainly. Uh, New York Roadrunners is a nonprofit uh, running organization. is a premier running organization in the in the country and in the world. And we put on the about sixty events a year. But this is of course pre COVID. And the mm -hmm. crown jewel is the TCS New York City Marathon that occurs every year on the first November and uh, the first Sunday in November. And for my specific role, I'm the senior manager, as you said, of runner training education. So I'm essentially the head of training. I oversee all of uh, adult training, both in person and virtual. And I do a lot of spokes, uh, spokes, spokesperson work and, and uh, media and PR work. So it gives me an opportunity to and a platform to really carry our message across the state, across the country and, and across the world as well. Have you coped with COVID? I mean, it's been devastating. Uh everywhere around the world obviously in america has been really massive you know so have you coped with what you're doing and the COVID yeah. itself yeah it's a great question so literally a year ago uh my wife and i and our kids just jumped in the car from new york and came up to maine for what we thought would be a, a weekend or two and 52 weekends later we're here so what uh my wonderful team that i have to shout out because without them i you know i wouldn't be able to do what i do uh what we were able to do in in a matter of days um, was pivot all our in-person training into virtual training. So virtual training means, you know, like what you and I are doing right now is an interview. It's a virtual interview versus in a studio together. So what we're able to do is um, make sure that we still were meaningfully impacting our runners and supporting them through this difficult time. And instead of training them in person where we'd meet at several locations like Central Park, we created these, we replicated these parks um, or cohorts, if you will, in virtual platforms. So we were able to do that and we did several versions of it throughout 2020. And we found that uh, that really helped a lot of people keep connected and together at a time when most of us were isolated due to quarantine. And there was a lot of an uncertainty and anxiety around what 2020 would um, evolve in. Now, about a year later, we still have a lot of virtual training, but now we're starting to slowly and gradually introduce in-person training as people are getting more vaccinated and, and we're a little bit more comfortable and, and familiar with um, how to navigate this this uh, COVID you know, era that we're still living in. 
So we're looking forward to probably uh, having uh, this year's edition in November. Uh, uh, um, you know, we, we obviously with the vaccination ramping up at the moment, should we be looking forward to that? Yes, this year, uh, you know, we still are working out the details, but the, the plan is to have the TCS New York City Marathon, and it should be our 50th um, anniversary, which we didn't get to celebrate in 2020. But yeah, I think this, the, the entire city and many runners across the country and, and the world are looking forward to it, as well as my my colleagues at, at New York Roadrunners, because, you know, they work, these men and women work really, really hard to impact our, our running community with our events, with our programming for, for kids, for adults. And you know, the the sooner we could get back to our our normal, if you will, the the better we're all going to feel. And the marathon, like I said, is the crown jewel, and it's a, just a giant celebration where the city comes out each year, and the world comes out, and we just celebrate running, which is something that clearly we love. Mm. You know, what, what, one of the first thing uh, question that came to my mind when Yomi said to me, uh, "You're going to be interviewing uh, Roberto today," and was. Um, is it okay for you to run? Because I see quite a lot of people, I live very close to the park here. I see quite a lot of people running in the parks. And I hardly see people running in the park with a mask on. Is it okay to run in the park or long distance or whatever you, uh, with a mask on? Yes, I mean, obviously everybody is different as far as what pre uh, conditions they might have. So we always say, and I say this as a coach, as a representative of New York Roadrunners, and also as a human, as a fellow human being, um, when in doubt or before starting any training, just consult your 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 healthcare provider, your physician, because you know two people might have the exact same age and more or less the same level of fitness, but you never know what's going on, as we say, under the hood. So COVID, whether you've had it or not just being in, in that atmosphere could affect people differently. So um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously loads of studies out there right now about why you should run with a mask versus not, um, why you should social distance versus not. So if you're gonna run out in the park, obviously there's fresh air and, and there's, and hopefully there's, you know, open space, but you know, you still wanna wear a mask because it's either you're protecting yourself and or protecting others. And I think that's the best way to go. And that's the way we've been operating at, at New York Road Runners as far as reintroducing group training and, and in-person and training mm. and you, you've 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 won um quite a few uh 20k 21ks in 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 las vegas in america so to say and yeah. um one of the other things that I, I i saw about you is like um you grace quite a lot of fitness magazines and uh, <laughs> the, the particular one i saw was the one that says um get ripped this is seven things <laughs> you need to do to get ripped and i'm yeah. thinking wow i'm gonna ask about to that today what did you do? How easy is it to you, for you to get re running? Uh, uh, well, that's a, you know, I, I like to say that genetics <laughs> loads the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. Mm. So genetics, you know, thank you to, to my, my mom who's watching, hopefully still. Um, but yeah, it, it's about, and, and then lifestyle pulls the trigger. So yeah, I was born with a certain, you know, genes as we all were, but lifestyle meaning how hard I work. So I think it's a combination of discipline, a good diet and and smart um, and safe training. So for me, when I was running professionally and, and running these extra races and, and winning and going to the world championships and things like that, I was running, you know, about 100 to maybe 120 miles a week. And I was working out at wow. the gym two to three times a week as well and i was working out not to get big and buff like you know maybe um uh, mr universe or, or something like that but to really support my running you know to make sure that my body was structurally sound and strong so i think by running so many miles and, and eating you know well i obviously had a lower body fat which accentuated you know the muscles and things like that but i i always tell people when you're when you're training just train to be as healthy and fit as you can be and don't chase a, a number, don't chase a scale. You know, obviously you see people in the magazine covers and they look fantastic and all that, but we all have different bodies and you have to train as best as you can for your body and, and the body will adjust. So, but yeah, for me, it's obviously super flattering. And, and for my mother who, again, she's watching, it's great she's to, watching, oh, there yeah. she is. I'm still here. Hold on. I'm still here, she says. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, for my mother, it, it's just fantastic to, to get to collect these magazine covers. And I started being on magazines long before I met my wife. And then after I met my wife and long before I became a father. So I think now that I have a, a seven month old son, I think, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, I'll be able to pull out a magazine cover and be like, hey, 
once upon a time your father was fit, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they still motivate me and I'm still out there training every day and, and trying to keep mm -hmm. fit because, um, I think it's a lifestyle choice for me and I want to be active for the rest of my life and be a good role model for, for my children. Um, the way my mother was a great role model for me growing up. Mm. Well, talking about being active, I see that you're also into snowboarding <laughs> and, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> so why snowboarding? Why not something else? Um, I mean, two things. Number one, I'm in Maine. So for those of you out there who are watching this from ah. elsewhere in the world, Maine is a winter wonderland. I'm not a fan of winter. You know, mm. Equatorial Guinea is nice and warm. Barcelona is nice and warm. And somehow I'm, I'm in Maine, you know, with my yeah. wonderful in-laws and, and my wife. But um, like I said, I've always been an athlete. So growing up when we were travel from country to country, I would adapt whatever the sport was. I, I love playing squash when I was, uh, again, in Southern Africa, rugby, cricket, uh, football, basketball, t you know. So when, um, when I came to the U.S. around high school, uh, I played ice hockey, which is not a sport that I'd ever heard about. And again, I was introduced to other winter sports. And snowboarding is something I, I really enjoyed. But I had to give up basically everything for... I don't know, 12 or 15 years when I was running professionally because, you know, I was mm. under contract and I couldn't get hurt. So now that I'm retired, I, I could enjoy if it's winter, I'm going to go snowboarding. If it's summer, I'll go swimming in the river or the lake or whatever. Um, and yes, yeah, so I recently went and took my oldest daughter for the first time. And again, I just wanted to introduce my kids to as many sports as I can, because it's all about physical literacy uh, when kids are, are young. And again, my mother did the same thing to me. So just trying to pay it forward. Mm. And when you're not working, and and and, and I know I, I probably know the the answer to this question I'm gonna ask you. Well, uh, for those that are not, that don't know and are watching and listening, when you're not working, um, what do you do to relax? Um, uh, uh, just like I said, I know a bit about what you do. Yes, <laughs> I sign up because yeah. I see a lot on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess this is where I plug my Instagram, like, subscribe, all that. Um, I mean, honestly, it, it just depends uh, when I'm, I, I quote unquote, relax very late into the day. Like once my kids are asleep and, and everybody's asleep, I, I, I tend to have dinner pretty late at night. So I, I've, for the last few years, I've really gotten into video editing. I, I like to just make fun mm -hmm. videos. Um, I amuse myself, but it really just to kind of impress my my kids as well with like papa magic as i call it so um yeah I'll, I'll either just get on my computer and edit some videos that i've shot throughout the day or you know i love languages um i i think if i had the time i would learn more than than i currently know so i'm either trying to learn a new language read about different countries and places i would like to travel or or video editing but it's all pretty late at night <laughs> And now tell me about what plans do you have for um, people in Equatorial Guinea, especially youngsters that probably have um, uh, heard about you, uh, they've raved about you, they want to be like Roberto, and they're probably sitting down there thinking, what do I need to do? Uh, how do I get to be like Roberto? How do I get to be like a role model? So what, yeah. what are you saying to them today? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, it's super flattering because I don't feel like I still don't feel like I'm that old that people should be looking up to me and want to be like me when they grow up. But at some point, I'm going to have to come to the realization like, hey, you're you're 39 years old. There's people who are maybe half your age who are looking up to you. But um, yeah, I mean, my my mother and I, who I keep obviously shouting out, and, and luckily she's on uh, watching. Is we we've talked about this many times. There's so many projects that we would like to do. It's just about finding the the right time and the right support system. You know, um, I know that you and I were speaking before I came on about uh, me being from uh, being born in Barcelona and being an FC Barcelona fan. So I love what Barcelona and many other football academies have done with La Masia, which for those who don't know, is their kind of grassroots system where they just bring in academy, players yeah. from all around. Yeah, academy. They bring in players from all around mm -hmm. the world when they're pretty young and they educate them in, in the Barcelona philosophy, the football way. But they also educate them like reading and writing and they set them up and a percentage of them will go on to play for some other world famous clubs around Europe. Some of them will go and play for FC Barcelona, which is a goal. You know, if they're listening, I want to send my kid there. Um, and then some of them will just go on to become just regular people like 
you and me, you know, working people, <laughs> but they've had that foundation, that education to set them up. So I would love to do something similar, um, in Equatorial Guinea, like some sort of sporting academy where we could bring in the country's youth um, and educate them, educate them reading, writing, set them up for uh, skills that would get them into the workplace in Equatorial Guinea elsewhere in Africa or Europe and, you know, but just set them up because I think that's how you invest in the country by investing in the future. You know, like I'm 39, I'm not that old, but like, I'm kind of already out the door and established. I have my wife, my kids, et cetera. But like that, those people, the best way to, you know, improve a country's athletics, et cetera, is to invest in the youth. And I think if we could get some sort of well-funded youth academy where you educate the, 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 the young kids, the, the youth in, in skills that are going to set them up and then also you have the people who focus on football the people who focus on athletics and so that and you bring in people like myself you bring in people who have reached a certain level in in, in the world in, in different sporting that I, I think that's the best way to go and and you know there's so many other templates out there already that you could follow like i said like fc barcelona with la masia but that's something i, I would love to do and that's something i i could see myself doing for many years into the future because it's not about how old I am. It's more about lending my experience, my connections, and 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 you know having obviously a receptive audience um, to do that with. Mm. Well, it's been so nice talking to you today, Roberto. Thoroughly enjoyed myself, uh, learning more about you. Um, so thank you for joining us on Better Convo today. And to mom out there, mom, thank you for uh, giving us this gift for Roberto. Thank you for, for that, all right? Roberto, yeah, thank you, Wole. Um, uh, thank you to, to everybody again, out there. Yeah, just to say again, uh, belated happy birthday to you. It was your birthday seven days ago. And um, yeah. um, I know you don't feel 39 at all. You probably feel 19 at the moment. So I feel pretty good. I, I don't know what I look like, <laughs> but uh, I feel good. And my kids keep me young. So, But uh, yeah, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, and thank you to... To better convo thank you to wally i think what you what you're all doing is fantastic and happy to have, to have been a part of it thank you so much Roberto, and good luck with the uh, uh um new york city uh, marathon this year okay if it comes up wish you all the best yeah. thank Fingers you so crossed. much thank and you. mom is just saying that i am very proud of you thank you thanks mom so um th thanks again roberto uh, don't make me old she said <laughs> all right we won't we'll try not to <laughs> all right <laughs> thanks Roberto. Thanks, right. thank you thank for you. for joining us today. Um, so that's better combo for today. Uh, if you thoroughly enjoyed today, please join us um, for our next edition. Okay, uh, be on the lookout for it, and don't forget to um, obviously like um, like this show, and obviously if you want to um, rewatch re it, because it's been pretty much interesting. Okay, make sure you subscribe at Latest Africa Better Combo, and you like every video, every podcast we uh, are put in there for you. Uh, special thanks to Yomi Omagaja, uh, the series producer. My name is Wally, and thank you for joining us. Um, have a wonderful week ahead. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day to all the Mother's Day. Thank you. Bye.